In this lecture, we're going to start optimization. So while this process is valid for a scalar value function of more variables, say a function from r3 to r, I'm going to assume that we're working with a function of the form z equals f of x and y, and we're going to assume our function is a differentiable c2 function. So recall that a C2 function is one for which the second order partial derivatives exist and are continuous. So in other words, f sub xx, f sub xy, f sub yx, f sub yy are all nice functions. Let's revisit a few results we've seen before. So the first one is Clairaut's theorem, which tells us if we're working with a C2 function like we want to work with in this lecture, then the order with which you compute mixed second order partial derivatives doesn't matter. So in other words, what I write as f sub xy would be the same thing as f sub yx. In other words, it doesn't matter if you differentiate first with respect to x, then y, or first with respect to y, then x. The other result I want to revisit is if the gradient of a function is the zero vector, and our function is a nice differentiable function, then in any direction indicated by unit vector v, the directional derivative of f at that point, again in the direction of some unit vector v, can be computed as the gradient of f at that point dot v. That was a result we had about differentiable functions. Now we're saying this gradient at this point is zero. It's the zero vector, so when I dot it with v, we're going to get a dot product of zero. In other words, if you're standing at a, b in the domain, and you look in any direction around you, you don't see that the function would increase or decrease. And that kind of behavior is what we're going to be interested in when we're looking for local and absolute extrema, so maxima and minima, for these scalar valued functions. So since f is a scalar valued function, its outputs are numbers and we're looking for the biggest and the smallest outputs it gives us. Okay, so down here in the right, I've given you a graph that looks like the graph of a function of the form z equals f of x and y. This is the MATLAB peaks surface. It's kind of a famous shape that MATLAB makes. Our maximum values, just based on the picture, happen in three places. Here, here, and here. Just based on the picture, it looks like we have two minimums for this function. So down here, kind of hidden behind this, the graph, and then over here to the right, you see this one quite clearly. And then also you might believe that in the middle, we have something that we would want to call a saddle, a place where the function feels flat, but there's a way to go up and a way to go down. So just looking at the graph of this function, how would you describe the planes tangent to the graph of this function at each of those extrema? And the answer is that at each of these local minima and maxima, the tangent planes are flat. In other words, a normal vector to each of these tangent planes I just drew could be taken to be the vector 0, 0, 1. But when we first studied tangent planes, we manually found that the normal vector for a plane tangent to the graph of a surface at a point is given by negative df dx, negative df dy, 1. Notice that df dx and df dy are the coordinates for the gradient of this function. This is a function of two variables, x and y, so that's what the gradient looks like. Therefore, it must be 0 when we're at an extrema. You may wonder, could it also be undefined? And generally, yes, but we're assuming that we're working with a nice differentiable function so that we can compute the gradient at each point. As a remark, this conclusion we just reached agrees with the observation that we made above about the directional derivative. If you're at an extrema, the gradient of your function is zero. So if you're standing right here, just at that point, the function feels flat. Down here at the minima, it feels flat. So when we're looking to optimize a scalar valued function of two variables like the one we have here, we are going to look for critical points of the function a critical point is one where the gradient is zero.
So we will compute the gradient of a function in order to identify its critical points. But then we need a way to test those critical points to figure out if we're at a maximum, a minimum, or a saddle. Now the test we're going to look at doesn't always work. Sometimes it's inconclusive. But in multivariable calculus, this is how we proceed. I'm going to introduce in what you can think of as a matrix of second partial derivatives for a function of this form. It's called the Hessian, so I'll write HF, so H for Hessian, F for F. At any point x, y, it's going to be a 2 by 2 matrix where the top left entry is F sub xx. The bottom left entry is F sub xy. The top right entry is F sub yx. And then the bottom right entry is F sub yy. Assuming that we're working with a nice differentiable C2 function, Clairaut's theorem tells us that f sub xy and f sub yx should be the same. So I'm going to rewrite this matrix suppressing the dependence on xy and using Clairaut's theorem. Now what we get from this matrix is what we will use in order to test critical points, and that is the determinant. So typically people immediately proceed to the determinant of this matrix which is product of the main diagonal terms minus the off diagonal terms. So that's going to give us f sub xx times f sub yy minus f sub xy squared because of Clairaut. And then typically for shorthand, we suppress the dependence on x and y and just write f sub xx, f sub yy minus f sub xy squared. This quantity is going to give us our test. So what we do is we take a critical point of f, so that would happen at some fixed x value and y value, and we evaluate d at that point. If at that point the quantity d is positive and f sub xx is positive, this tells us that we're looking at a local min. If on the other hand d is positive and f sub xx is negative, we're looking at a local max. If d is negative, you're done with the test, it's a saddle point. There's one possibility we've left off, and that is that d is 0, in which case this test is inconclusive. In mathematics, we do have other ways to test. You could also look at the graph of the function to try to determine what the behavior is. But in terms of our multivariable calculus second derivative test, if d equals 0, it's inconclusive. Okay, let's try that test for this function. f of x and y equals 2x squared minus 4xy plus y to the fourth plus 2. The first thing we need to do is identify any critical points. So we're looking for xy pairings for which the gradient is 0. Okay, so what is the gradient in general? Let's see, differentiate with respect to x and we get 4x minus 4y. Differentiate with respect to y, 4x plus 4y cubed. That's a lot of fours, so let me factor that out. That's just a scalar out front of the vector. And we'll have x minus y. And for the second coordinate, I'll write y cubed minus x. We are looking for values of x and y together that make both coordinates simultaneously zero. So we want x minus y to be zero and y cubed minus x to be 0. Now the equations that result from this calculation can be easy or hard. It really just depends on the function. In this case, it's not too bad. So the first coordinate requires that x and y are the same. So when I plug that into the second coordinate, we're going to say y cubed minus y equals 0. So I can factor a y out of that, and I get y times y squared minus 1 equals 0, which is satisfied when y is 0 plus or minus 1. Then the x coordinate would be the same because x equals y, so we can list out that there are three critical points. 1 at 0, 0, 1 at 1, 1, and 1 at negative 1, negative 1. My second step would be to compute d. So in general, that's going to be f sub xx, which is the derivative of the first coordinate of the gradient with respect to x. So that's going to be 4 
times f sub y, y. So that's the derivative of the second coordinate of the gradient with respect to y. So that's going to be 12y squared. And then minus f sub x, y squared. So you can either take the first coordinate of the gradient and differentiate it with respect to y, or take the second coordinate of the gradient and differentiate it with respect to x. It's up to you. So it's going to be negative 4, and then we're going to square that. Okay, so that's going to be 48y squared minus 16. Or we can write 16 times 3y squared minus 1. Okay, that's the quantity d of x, y in general, but now we need to check that specifically at our critical points. Okay, so let's do d of 0, 0 first. That would be 16 times 0 minus 1. So that's negative 16, which is less than 0. That tells me that at the origin, our function is a saddle. There's a way to go up and a way to go down from that point as we move away from the origin. Next, we'll do d of 1, 1. That's going to be 16 times 3 minus 1, which is 32. You don't have to actually compute the number 32. If you can look at that and say, you know what, that's going to be 16 times 2 is positive, right? What we really care about here is the sign. Okay, if that determinant quantity is positive, then we also need to know how f sub x, x behaves at the point. For this particular function, our second derivative of f with respect to x is actually a constant 4, which is also positive. Both positive tells us local min. Let's repeat this calculation for the other critical point, so we'll compute the determinant at negative 1, negative 1. It's actually going to be the same. It's 16 times 3 minus 1. So that's positive, and once again, the second derivative of f with respect to x is also positive. So I'm going to graph this function, and what we expect to see is a saddle and two local minimums, no local maximums. You can ask yourself, can I draw such a function of one variable? If y equals f of x, and it's a nice differentiable function, can we have a saddle and two local mins? And I'm pretty sure the answer is no, but it is possible for this kind of function, z equals f of x and y. So here's a picture of this function. The two local minimums are fairly clear, so you can see these down here. The saddle is where we turn from one to the other. Sometimes students struggle to see this, but the idea is from this middle point, there's a way to go up, kind of going up the side, and a way to go down, which is to travel down to the local minimums. I will end this lecture here. So this is an introduction to optimization, but we're going to look at a couple more topics with optimization. So if we are looking for local extrema for a scalar valued function of multiple variables, which is nice differentiable C2, the first thing we do is compute the gradient so that we can find critical points. Now this step could be easy, it was fairly easy in this problem, or it could be really hard. It depends on what the coordinates of the gradient look like. So if you have a really tricky function, it might be hard to solve that system of equations. But you're looking for points x, y that make both coordinates simultaneously zero. Then you compute that determinant quantity. Then you evaluate that quantity at the critical points you found, and that gives you a way to classify critical points as saddles, local minimums, local maximums, if the test is conclusive. What we haven't discussed in this lecture are absolute extrema. So what this test is doing is saying that if you find a critical point where the determinant and the second derivative of f with respect to x are both positive, it's a local minimum. It's not necessarily the absolute minimum. So what a local minimum is, is like we saw in the picture, a point around which locally f is only increasing as we move away from that point. Similarly, this test can find local maxima. It doesn't tell us where the absolute maxima are. So where's the overall largest value of our function if it exists? So we have more to look forward to. Thank you for your attention.